All right, here we go. Okay, so some of this will be a little bit of review uh, because we have had our first draping demo, uh, but we were kind of just so far focused on the back and I kind of want to make sure we go over everything, also answer your questions. So uh, as I mentioned yesterday, draping is the term that massage therapists use uh, for the covering and uncovering our clients with sheets or linens. And the purpose of it is that we want to establish and maintain professional boundaries, preserving the modesty of the client, and also keeping them warm and comfy. Uh, so, you know, in addition to or on top of the linens and uh, um, uh, sheets, you know, we can also use blankets to help keep them warm and comfortable. So, you know, if you were to think about some images with this, you know, draping can keep your clients feel nice and cozy, like a swaddle, like you swaddle an infant. And speaking of swaddling, this is a lovely time to mention, you know, I just said you could use blankets. Uh, a lot of folks uh, with a lot of different conditions are comforted by weighted blankets. And so you could get weighted blankets for your clients and many of them would benefit from that. It can help with uh, folks on the spectrum, all kinds of mental health issues, anxiety. Uh, so you can comfort your clients with a weighted blanket instead of a swaddle. I don't know how they feel about being swaddled. Although there are some spa treatments that are very swaddly. Yeah, that's not, I yeah, so it's kind of like an easy add, right, to your session, just kind of getting your clients, uh, you know, relaxed, right? It's all about getting them into that rest and just digest uh, parasympathetic mode, which we're going to be uh, studying next week uh, in detail. So it takes practice to drape wells, you know, so we're going to be doing a lot of supervised practice in the, in the lab, step by step. Uh, please make sure you study this module and the reading to go with this. And then don't practice things we haven't practiced in the lab yet, even a draping technique. So if you're somebody, a loved one needs uh, something on their leg or something massage, you know, for now they could, um, you know, you could work through the um, clothes until we get to that draping. Just keep it real safe. And uh, please, you know, just let me know if you have any questions. I'm gonna go back here for a second. So uh, practice with great care and attention. Uh, it's better to be slow and err on the side of caution than kind of rush through things. Speed will come later. Uh, as you may recall me mentioning, I practice in a community orchestra with my older kid who's 15 years old right now. And one of our conductors has this kind of cheesy phrase, but I really like it because in music like massage, you know, when you learn, you learn by first slowing it down and then you can speed it up later. So he calls that tempo to learno. That's kind of cheesy, but it really stuck. So we got to start off with tempo to learno and then you can learn massage therapist speed later on. So we just nice and slow and, uh, Take it easy. Uh, communication is key. So your communication is as important as your draping techniques. You're kind of at an advantage in some ways as a student massage therapist, because some massage therapists who've been in the field forever are so comfortable giving and receiving massages that some of them may forget sometimes how nervous and vulnerable and unknowing and uncertain a lot of the clients are, right? So it's almost like, you know, you can take that new experience for yourself and sort of apply that to your clients, right? And so the more clear we can be about every step of the way, that adds some comfort for them, yeah. And don't ever assume because they had a massage from somebody else that they know what's gonna go on, right? So just always take that extra care. It can go a long way, it really can. I know a lot of massage therapists who 
are especially good at new clients and uh, they love taking that extra care to just really help the clients understand everything that's going to happen, right? So you need the client's permission to undrape anything. And as I mentioned yesterday in lab, this is good to get permission ahead of time uh, and make very clear in your treatment plan with informed consent what you're going to work on directly and what you're going to work on through the drapes and what you're not going to not touch at all. Um, so get that permission ahead of time rather than every step of the massage. Can I touch here? Can I touch here? Can I undrape here? Can I undrape here? Now, as we practice each area, we are going to ask permission to undrape. Uh, but in a real massage, that would drive people crazy, right? To be like, oh, can I touch your shoulders now? Can I touch your back now? And they'll be like, can you shut up now? I just wanted to relax. Yeah, but but do ask ahead, right? Don't make assumptions. So we only undrape the areas that we are going to massage. And the only exception really is if the client's really hot, which will happen usually in the summer or sometimes if they're having a hot flash or pregnancy heat or whatever, um, sometimes they'll ask, oh, I'm, I'm too hot. Can you, you know, take off some of these drapes? And uh, usually you can cool them down enough just kind of by undraping their feet or something like that. Uh, we don't want to get into like, fully uncovering people, right, who have, you know, sketchy motives, like, oh, I'm too hot, and throwing off their sheets, right? No. Um, questions? All right, areas that we never undrape. Uh, and on the test exam, you'll see, like, the word expose. We never undrape the breast. You know, specifically, we never get below the, we never show the nipple line, the genitals, the gluteal cleft, which is the butt crack, and the anus. Can I just say, um, a lot of people are missing the gluteal cleft in their assignment. Ah, uh, so that's the word for the butt crack, and we never let that crack show. We never undrape below it, and we never undrape half of the butt past the crack like a fault line. We keep that covered. Questions? All right. So kind of our goal, you know, as we get good at this is that we want it to be precise and efficient and neat and snug. So, you know, this is a pretty good picture. You know, you'll want like a tight clean line close to the skin. So they're very snug like that swaddle. And that helps them feel like you can't see things that you shouldn't, right? This is a client's leg. We don't want them to feel like you can look at their pubic area. And so if they're all tight, they don't, you know, they feel snug and secure. That's why it matters to be precise, right? And have this tight line. Yes. Um, so like when we get the back myself yesterday, yep. Yep, great. Uh, great question. Um, yeah, so there's another slide on that, but yes, um, doesn't answer the second part of your question, though. Uh, yeah, so we talked, uh, just to reiterate the question, because it's hard to peer people in the class, you know, we talked under the underwear with permission, can you do that with shorts and so forth? Yes. Um, any, any clothes that the client leaves on, you can get permission to tuck under it. And you don't want really, to, you don't want to, like, pull things down or up in a way, obviously, that feels sexual. Uh, but if we tuck under them, then we keep the clothes from getting oily or lotion-y. Uh, so uh, Taylor was using an example of tucking under boxer shorts. Yeah, great. Um, but as an example of like where we don't, you know, if the, if the person's wearing underwear, we don't want to tuck under and then really pull that down, right? Or like um, a style where it starts to, you know, tug on them. Yeah, any other questions so far? 
This part in red here on the bottom, I uh, mentioned during the demonstration most definitely because it's a very important thing about when you're draping. We want to keep that drape or the sheet close to the body and we don't want to ever make any fluffing kind of air like you're playing a, um, what is that with the tablecloth? You know, we don't want any kind of, yeah. So it's just, we don't want it to feel airy to the client because then they kind of wonder subconsciously or directly, like, what are you seeing? Um, if we're going to move, I'm on the bottom line here. If you're going to pull on a bottom sheet, like you're going to straighten it, uh, sometimes they'll get out of order as you're having clients flip over if it starts to pull away or something. You, if you're going to pull on it, you can either have the client hold their top sheet down or you can hold the top sheet down just to make sure you're not kind of pulling everything at once. Um, and uh, does that bring up a question? All right. So I demonstrated this tucking at the sides yesterday with our back drape. Um, we want to uh, tuck in the sides again, it's going to feel secure and then we don't have areas exposed. So here's an example. Some people who are lazy with their draping will just pull the sheet down. And if you don't tuck the sides and you leave these big pockets, the person might feel vulnerable. They might feel like you can see things. Also, if you leave the drape like that, it can kind of scooch its way down and in fact might expose the client. So we always tuck them nice and secure. Sometimes when you're doing your techniques, uh, maybe you're jostling the client around or whatnot, sometimes it might get untucked and then you can just uh, ask permission and retuck it. Yep. Questions, comments? There you go. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So here's here's the one uh, we were just talking about as far as the tucking under underwear with permission. Uh, you ask first, and then if you tuck the sheets under, like we did in lab demonstration yesterday, uh, the the main thing here is that it keeps their clothes from getting oily or lotiony, right? And and if you were going to be tucking around like a, a bra or something like that too, you know, same thing. It's just those garments are very expensive. Uh, so we don't want to ever get oil or lotion on them. Uh, don't, don't assume that the client's just going to clean that, right? It's hard to get out oil and those things can cost like, you know, 60 bucks, 100 bucks. What are they, whatever they leave on, if they do, underwear, bras, binders, you know, anything. But sometimes a client will leave on socks and they don't really care. So by the time you get to the feet, right, you can, you know, the, they, they sometimes will take them off themselves or they'll ask you to or, you know, so sometimes you'll kind of, you know, remove that for them. Some folks will also leave on like uh, compression stockings. Uh, this is particularly common if you work with older clients. And sometimes those compression, like medical grade compression stockings for the elderly in particular can be very difficult for them to remove. And it might take so long that, you know, it's just like they just decide to leave it on, right? So you might um, not be taking off things like that either. Yep. So uh, it's a big been thinking a long time. Yep. Um, so this is a different direction, but um, have you had situations where when you're able to just kind of find the other person taking a super long time? Yeah. Um, how do you politely move that along, you know, like a little knock on the door, kind of help the same thing, is everything okay? Like, how do you yeah, it's been pretty rare for me that clients take too long, but yeah, it's okay to knock on the door just to kind of, you know, check on them. Hey, how are you? And every once in a while when I do that, it'll turn out that the client like snuck out and I think I'm waiting on somebody who actually left. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, they might occasionally like fall asleep or you know, the senior citizens, uh, some of them take the longest because sometimes it takes them so long to get their clothes on. 
but right now I work at one of those places where, I mean, we see people every hour. So the turnaround time is like five minutes for everything. And the clients are almost always fast enough. Yeah, but it's okay to knock, check in on them. I have worked at places and have enjoyed also scheduling more time between clients and just saying, yeah, take as long as you like and letting people take a little nap. Um, so I've worked at places like that too. Yeah, yeah. I have people come to my house sometimes uh, and massage me there and then I could just sleep right after. You know, that's the best. You don't have to drive, you know. But you want your people to be safe to drive again. They'll get real massage brainy, spacey, tired, you know, have them have some water, wake up a little bit, catch an Uber. All right. So the, the, this is a very, very important one here. Okay. I'm like, I would be like all caps right now yelling at you in red. This one's very important. So this boundary is a boundary. The sheet is a boundary that you are creating. It's an agreement with the client that you are not going to cross that line. So wherever that line is, this person is like in football, this would be like a really bad penalty, like a 15 yard penalty. Uh, you do not go under the sheet. Um, so if your sheet is not low enough, you can get the client's permission to redrape, right? But we don't slide under the sheet. So this red circle is what you do not do. So you do not cross the drapes. You do not cross the sheets. Questions on that one? So if, you know, very oftentimes, you know, you'll have, of course, part of the body undraped and part of the body draped, you know, part skin to skin, part sheets. If you have permission to touch the client in this area, you may touch them over the sheets, right? So even though this is a boundary that you don't slide under, if you have an agreement to work in this area, you know, you could be working with this example with this client, you could be massaging their skin directly on their back, even while you're working with their glutes or hips on top of the sheets, right? So sometimes you'll be making these connections. And so you might make a connection with the hip and the back, you might make a connection with the knee and the back. So it's okay to touch on top of the sheets as long as you have permission to touch in that area. Does that bring up any questions? All right. So every once in a while, you're going to make a mistake and hope it's extremely, extremely rare. But if you accidentally undrape a client too low or you accidentally touch them somewhere you should not, uh, you should let them know and you should not pretend like it did not happen. So this is, uh, I would say, the most common thing that students do is accidentally touch a client with the part of their body they're not trying to touch them. So a student might bump a client's arm with their hip while they're trying to touch their back. You still want to say, oh, I'm sorry, I bumped you with my hip. So they don't wonder, like, what is touching me and is this person creepy, right? So that's the most common is just a harmless, like, you brush up against them somewhere you're not trying to touch them and you just let them know. Uh, but every once in a while, um, you know, you might accidentally uh, undrape them too low uh, or a sheet comes undone a little and you say, I'm sorry, and you redrape them and you fix the problem right away. The most common thing that massage therapists get reported for get sued for, lose their licenses for, disciplinary action for, is all of the ethics stuff, right? We very rarely, massage is very safe, and we very rarely uh, can injure somebody. But if you're, uh, what, what you might get reported for, right, is if you have uh, sketchy boundaries around your draping and so forth. So these are things that you just want to be, you know, really, really careful about.
And of course, we're here to help you, your teachers. So, right, if there's one something that you're feeling is just a little awkward and you're really not sure how to do it, you know, just ask us and we'll help you. So communicating about the draping with your clients. A um, couple things about giving direction. Um, first of all, we're getting a permission about what areas we're undraping, like I said, and we're getting permission about that ahead of time. We're getting clear about areas we're not working. And so we're clear about all of that ahead of time. So that's kind of like first step. Uh, there's a separate slide uh, with some language and a separate slide for flipping the client over. So your licensing exam might have some draping questions that use the word exposed. Uh, that refers to like if you undraped an area, you should not like the nipples or genitals or so forth. Right. So that's always a bad thing, obviously. Uh, I'm calling out the word exposed, though, because that might be a test word, but not a word you should use with your client, right? Because that would be make them feel more vulnerable. So you don't say, I'm going to, is it okay if I expose your low back? And no, exposed has a bad connotation. So you'd say, is it okay if I uncover your back, not exposed? Does that make sense? But you might see it as a test word. It's okay if you have uh, questions. If it doesn't really make sense, let me know. All right. So at RTC, we use a very conservative, very safe draping protocols. Um, out in the field, there are certain scenarios where you might have a less conservative draping. And once you're licensed, you might use some other draping. For example, if you work at a spa, there are certain types of spa treatments that might use less coverage. They might even just use a towel, um, but we're not going to do anything like that. Um, there's also something called a half drape where an entire half of the body is undraped at one time. That can be good for some things like making connections in the body, but it can feel more vulnerable and we're not gonna do that here. Um, so we're gonna do uh, the tucking at the sides always. And then for the arms and legs, we're gonna always use what's called a range of motion draping. And a range of motion draping and there's pictures coming up and we will teach you in lab. Basically the sheet ends up coming all the way around your arm or leg. So you're, the client is completely circled. And so they're just very secure and secure enough even if you're moving their body. Um, what some people used to be taught and so some people still practice is called a simple drape where on the arms and legs, they might just tuck instead of going all the way around. So some of you might've had professional massages like that. Uh, it's not that it's illegal or anything, uh, but we're not going to do that here. We're just going to go all the way around the leg, arm. We'll show you how to do that. Just keep them extra secure. Uh, questions, comments? Have any of you had uh, any, you don't have to share, but any um, other kind of draping, like at a spa treatment or something or, yeah? Yeah, one time they just didn't have no draping. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like one of those scrubbing treatments. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in some countries too, right? There's different draping protocols or there's like a wonderful treatment where they just scrub you within an inch of your life. And that is a naked, uh, that's in a, like that's a wet spa treatment though. Yes? Scrub you within an inch. Really? I think it's so good. Feels so good. I actually, Okay, when I'm talking about a lupus spa, yes, I like to scrub about. better than the massage. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> question in the back. 
Well, I was just going to say, I think that those are really good for the first time. I think they're going to have several pictures of different things that they can do. And uh, but that's lovely. Yes, like I'm going to sort of have to do this. Yeah. Or like the different things that they found that you sort of want to do. Nice. So it's cool to like see how it goes to the data. That's cool. I like a menu. Yeah. Picture menu. Yes. Well, I did the Olympic class. I was in tent. Uh, but also, I there was a, a male massage therapist that I had been going to for years. And um, there was one time that he had a touch to my head and did like this big fluff thing with the feet. Oh, man. That was super uncomfortable. So, yeah, it definitely was. Fluff, fluffing can feel, yeah, uncomfortable. Yeah, I felt so really mm. that was I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Yes. I guess the question. I pretty much always wear my underwear when I'm getting massaged. Yeah. But I have never had a massage therapist ask if they could wear stuff under the way they do Uh, yeah. Do you, like, is that just like the thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, I don't know how they were taught in school, but uh, you'll see some massage therapists sort of out in practice doing some things more casually and less, you know, uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, useful to kind of. Uh, ask and take the most precautions. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would say it's not uncommon, right, for somebody to do that, but I think it's better to ask. Yeah, I think it's kind of along the lines of the simple drape where, uh, it's not, uh, that, that a lot of people will just still do like a single tuck that's faster, um, but it's not, it's not quite as, uh, secure. Yes. Okay, you might come back. All right, and so, you know, I've already been talking about this range of motion draping. We do this with the arms and the legs. It fully circles the arms or the legs. And we'll teach you this. It's not an easy thing to fully grasp from a picture, uh, but it's nice. It keeps the client modest, even if you're moving them around. So this is obviously something we'll teach you in lab. But it's called a range of motion draping. And it's nice and secure. And you can see from the top picture compared to the bottom picture. So this sheet has come around from the medial side to the lateral side. They gave the tail of the sheet to the client to hold. And so they have a tight swaddle all the way around the leg. And you can see how this is close to their leg as composed to this, situ this fluffy situation here that uh, there's some kind of air happening there at the butt and that's not good. And the client may or may not feel secure, right? But we just wanna make sure that they do. Like a client may not, may not feel that, but we just always are as you know, safe as possible. We just want them to feel safe. Yes. Um, that's actually what it is. So we are in first under C4 when but uh, it still surprises me because I've had so much massage so many places. It's more medical, not spa. And um, I, we talked about like them drinking the, the glutes. I've never had a massage therapist try to undrink my glutes, like, you know, appropriately, even like you've talked about, not not more than the mid -line. Never had that happen. And, it sounded like that that is perhaps normal for that to happen. Uh, yep. Yeah, never had anybody ask me. Yep. So, I mean, I would say, of course, it's only okay if the person asks and you get informed consent on it. Uh, but it is a, a common and appropriate practice. If this was tighter right there, this amount of undraping, you know, is is good and fine. Let's say this client is, uh, this therapist is massaging up the leg. 
they can now get all the way around this greater trochanter really well. That's what I'm spinning around right here is the greater trochanter. Um, you know, there are some massage places like the franchises that don't do glutes skin on skin, right? And and that might, you know, the, the culture at some places has kind of changed, but there's a lot of places that uh, still do that and it can be very uh, therapeutic and professional and appropriate. And, you know, if the client wants to leave on underwear and leave on a sheet, that's also fine just to work through that, like with the compression stuff we did. But this is a critical, critical area to massage uh, with and only with the client's permission. Uh, there's going to be a lot of low back issues um, and hip problems, uh, knee problems, even where, you know, that, that, all the around the, the hips, the sacrum, the greater trochanter, the uh, ischial tuberosity, uh, the muscles in there are, are crucial, right? But you can massage them through the drapes like we were doing in the compression routine. So really up to the client's comfort level on that one. I worked with a massage therapist once and said she never worked on the glute. Woo! I just made her uncomfortable. I was like, what, what do you do? What do you Working at chiropractic office. What's going on? Yeah, I've always had it like compression, and they did it with a sheet over me. Like I can't imagine them not working on it because it is so vital. But yeah, there's some food for thought. All right, so having a client turn over. Um, there's some crucial things here, and when we have the clients turn over and they're draped in lab, we will go over this. Uh, but a couple major things is that you can see how this massage therapist has the sheets pinned to the table uh, with their thighs. Uh, so we don't want that sheet to go running away, right? Um, the other most important thing about this is that you don't want to tell the client, go ahead and flip over or roll over until you completely have everything ready. Because a lot of clients, they're just relaxing, right? By this time, they're very, very relaxed. As soon as you tell them to roll over, they will. So you don't tell them to roll over while you're starting to get everything situated. You get everything situated, and then you tell them to roll over. That's the most important thing. That and having this pinned. Um, and we will show you how to hold the sheet so that you're not accidentally uh, touching their genitals or breasts or anything like that. Questions? Oh, I'm sorry, yep. Um, yeah. yeah, great question. Um, some massage therapists really swear by a certain direction of the role. Uh, I let the client choose their role, um, but you know, some people would swear by if you had this client in the picture roll away from you, that that would kind of help these sheets kind of not bunch up towards you. So you can experiment as long as you're holding them well, the sheets, uh, if you like one better than the other, but you might experiment with them rolling away from you so that, you know, you're pinning these sheets so they're not going anywhere uh, as opposed to, you know, you don't want to, that's all pull towards you. But I let, I let the client choose on that. I just get everything secure first. Yep. I have never had anybody roll off the table. Uh, no, I've never heard of anyone rolling off the table. Have you? Um, <laughs> no, I haven't had anybody actually roll. I've had a couple times where I've had to like grab a hip and like pull them back, pull them back, scooch yeah. them back on. Yeah, yeah. But, I've done some traxes and things where you know you pull them so hard they're leaving the table, but never pulled anybody fully off the table. Sometimes. What I started to do, because I had that happen once, is that somebody wasn't like lined up perfectly in the middle of the table and then they rolled off to the side that they were the closest to. And so when I have somebody who's not like perfectly lined up, I tell them now, like, okay, you're close to the edge on the left side. So, you know, just keep that in mind that you don't want to like roll off the table. Yeah, and that's a great point, especially especially like if people have already sometimes they'll just situate themselves really weird. Um, so it's okay to tell them to move. It's okay to have them scooch up closer so you can reach them. It's okay to ask them to 
you know, scooch to one side or the other. Um, and, you know, we'll show you this when we do more draping techniques, but sometimes the sheets kind of move around too. And so, you know, what we do may look very sort of anal or rigid, but we're going to keep straightening and evening those sheets. And the reason is so that we have good coverage everywhere, you know, so that they're not kind of shimmying to one side and then we kind of lose them. I think this is a, you know, a good time because you're going to start doing more homework massages now with sheets. And, you know, we kind of mentioned this before, but it's more in your mind now. And now we're draping to kind of talk about, you know, what kind of sheets to get or not get. Um, a cotton or poly blend is going to be the easiest to work with as a beginner. Flannel sheets are really cozy and I love them, but they're really stretchy and kind of as a beginner, they're harder to work with. And silk is too slippery. Uh, you don't want something that's so slippery that you can't tuck it. So like a cotton or poly blend is nice. Some people swear by patterns to sort of hide oil. Some people swear by white sheets so that you can use bleach. White sheets will kind of get thinner looking faster. So it kind of depends. Are you going to also use a blanket on top of your client for extra modesty and warmth? Um, and certain colors tend to look a little oilier faster, right? So um, yeah, does that bring up sheet, other sheet questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah, great question. So the reason we're using an impermeable thing is because we are using table warmers that cannot be properly cleaned. If you're not using anything on top of the table, you don't need a table cover because those tables are made of a material that you can clean. Um, Yes, if you have rips in the upholstery, you can also use a table cover like that. Yeah. So, but if you are going to use fleece layers or extra foam layers or anything like that, can't be cleaned properly. So that's that's when you use one of those plastic on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. And so some people like to add like memory foam or egg carton foam, right? For extra for your client, you know, that's yeah, or a table warmer. I used to be able to find these table warmers that were made out of that material that you could use hospital grade cleaner on and they're awesome. And then you don't need anything like that. I haven't been able to find them recently. So I, I should probably check again. They might be available again. Yes. The, um, any preference for the vinyl or plastic cover? Oh, the table? Yeah. I like the impermeable layer that Taylor's talking about. I have a vinyl cover that I wear. Uh, I'm not aware myself of a preference. Do you, do you Elizabeth? No. no. The only the only complaints that I've heard have mostly been regarding the covers being like too baggy and like scooching around a lot mm -hmm. or being really crinkly. But I think the newer ones aren't aren't too bad. They're, pretty fitted and quiet. And the same thing applies for like some massage therapists will just use like a bed pillow instead of a bolster. And the same thing applies for that. You can't clean them properly. So you either want a hospital pillow that you can clean properly or a, hos a hospital pillow cover that you can clean properly. So last but not least, you know, just to kind of reiterate, kind of review, your techniques should be snug, neat, efficient. You don't want a lot of little, you know, futsy kind of little extra tucking movements or drafts of air. Um, and you want to be careful where you're grabbing the sheet from that you're not grabbing it in an area that's really close to a client's genitals or breasts. Um, so there might be adjustments you need to make sometimes on a sheet and you just want to be careful. Like you're not making the adjustment here. You're making the adjustment from some, a safe zone, right? Yep. Yesterday when we were doing like the and all of that. Yep. 
Um, I was kind of surprised. I mean, of course, like we have somebody uh, that has this that you can easily like you really have to kind of watch your fingers. Yep. Up on that side. Uh huh. Right there. Uh huh. Don't even go there. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, of course, it depends on the size of the client's breath and also how much adipose tissue or fat that they have. So some clients, whether they're face up or face down, you know, you can kind of get to the sides more and other clients, you have to avoid a bigger zone to avoid the breast. So uh, starting tomorrow, when we really go through a sequence that includes the sides, we'll be really kind of looking at and talking about that more precisely, right? Okay. Yeah. So the, the general idea for Swedish though, and that's actually where we're going next is Swedish, is that you do want to massage them three-dimensionally. Mm -hmm. So you do want to include the sides, but not obviously on breast tissue. Yeah, I was a little nervous about that. I mean, I wanted to you know, do that, but I just, I just didn't want to be in the inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. It's always, of course, better to err on the side of caution, right? Yeah. Any other draping questions? All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about, uh, the next and last thing we're going to talk about is introduction to Swedish massage. Do you want to break before we do that? No. No. We're hearing mostly no's. I don't think we have time for a All right. So Swedish massage is kind of known as, you know, the relaxing massage. You know, if you go to massages in a spa setting or actually many different types of clinic, even the sort of the basis of uh, some of the techniques done before people uh, to warm up for a treatment massage, uh, Swedish massage is one of the main techniques. Um, some people think of Swedish massage sort of just as a long flowy strokes, but if you look at all of the types of strokes in Swedish massage, including petrissage, that lifting, squeezing, uh, the vibration, which includes rocking and uh, fine vibration, tapotement or percussion, as well as deep friction, it actually can do a lot. And I think the one that probably people think of the least is friction, because once you add friction, you're basically, you can do treatment work, right? I mean, a lot of treatment work is combining friction and compression. So you can really do a lot with Swedish massage. Um, but we're going to kind of start off, you know, that thinking about Swedish massage, we want to be a very relaxing experience. And we want to activate people's parasympathetic nervous system. This is a big, bing, 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 important thing of massage that also you would be tested on in your licensing exam. So we're going to read a whole article and have a whole discussion next week all about parasympathetic versus sympathetic. Uh, but parasympathetic is your part of your nervous system that is sort of, it's called your rest and digest part of the system. And so this is where your body has a chance to do its own healing and uh, versus the fight or flight part of the system. And a lot of times we're in this perpetual state of fight or flight going from one stressor to the other. And so our body's not really having a time to relax. And there's so much healing that is done in the, in the rest and digest part of the system that a huge part of the effects of massage whether it's the effects or the benefits, is really based on getting your clients in a relaxed state. So this cannot be uh, overemphasized. Even if you're doing a treatment massage, it's critical that you get your client in a parasympathetic mode, even if you're treating them for a very specific injury. Are there questions or comments so far? So there's, you know, some videos and things in here, and I'm not going to go over that. Some of you might have noticed Spanish. Uh, I would love to have many languages translated. I've received grants for various translation projects, and the first one we did this part two was uh, Spanish. 
Uh, you might have noticed that there's multiple languages for the Quizlets, uh, but it costs a lot of money to have things translated professionally. So I've been doing it in order of the students we have speaking different languages. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we don't have all the languages yet. Certainly, we would never have all the languages, but I'd like to see at least uh, 10 languages eventually. Just by what we have most on campus. All right, so the primary um, techniques in, in a Swedish massage, and these are definitely techniques you should know by name, are effleurage, petrissage, friction, tapotement or tapotement, and joint movements. Now, tapotement um, is more commonly now called percussion. Not uh, People used to call it tapotement more, so you should also know it as percussion. And then the joint movements can also be called Swedish gymnastics. That's what they were first called. And they can also be called, you know, range of motion or the different specific types. So effleurage is our long flowy strokes. You know, this as we looked at very briefly yesterday it can be used to put on the lotion or oil. This is often used at the beginning of the session or right after compression. This is also a beautiful technique to do transitions between different techniques. It brings blood to the area. It's a great way to warm up the tissue. Uh, it's very relaxing. And we wanna go light to deep to light. So as I started to show you in the lab, even with these long flowy strokes, after we're starting off light, we then get actually sinking into the muscle. Questions so far? Petrissage is that one, and this is a great picture. Uh, this is that one that's really like kind of working with dough. We're lifting, kneading, squeezing, twisting, pulling. Uh, and it also is really great for getting blood to the area, warming up the tissue. Uh, so the effleurage and petrissage are often used kind of near the beginning to warm up an area. But then when we've done deeper work like friction, like let's say we work out some adhesions or knots, or we work out some trigger points with something deeper, we can then come back and use more effleurage and petrissage to soothe and ease and flush the area again. What happens with a tight muscle, lots of things happen. But one thing that happens is that it's, if it's in a constant state of contraction, we're not getting as much blood flow. So one thing we wanna really do with our techniques is bring the blood in, bring the blood out, right? Because that's gonna carry the wastes out and the nutrients in. So these techniques are very good for that. Questions, comments? Friction, two major types. Well, deep friction can be broken into more types. But there's a warming friction, which is a superficial uh, that you can really kind of get an area warm. You'll see this tomorrow. And then the deep friction techniques, there's more than one type. Uh, there's cross fiber friction. If the fibers were going up and down, you would go perpendicularly across them, but deep. And linear friction or parallel friction, if the fibers are going like this, you're going with them. You can use different tools. We're not often using a finger. <laughs> and circular friction sounds like what it is. You're going in a circle. Um, these things are good for scars, trigger points, adhesions, and origins and insertions. And we will spend a lot of time with this. So you'll see lots of different applications, yeah. But this is the part of Swedish where if you apply this very specifically and knowledgeably, this is treatment work, right? So people think of Swedish just as this relaxing thing. But if you do Swedish massage well, I mean, you can really do so much with it. Questions, comments? Notice that this client skin is pink. You know, we will often be warming up tissue to the point where that is visible and palpable. You'll see it get more pink. You'll feel it get warmer. You want that to happen before you're going deep and slowing down. 
Uh, Tapotment or percussion is the rhythmic or drumming technique. We talked about how we don't want to do that on the kidneys. Uh, bony landmarks. Um, a lot of massage therapists use this near the end. And the tapotment is the category. And then depending on what part of your hands you use, there's different names. So you could be slapping or tapping or cupping or hacking. Uh, and so if you were to see a testing question on the exam that said what kind of techniques are slapping, cupping, hacking, those would all be tapotment. If you were going to see an exam question that said, what kind of technique is cupping? They're talking about tapotment with your hands cupped. They're not talking about the cupping that I will teach you from acupressure. Yes. When it comes to tapotment, like, um, like, I don't know what this is called, but I think it's when I was really able to pull the first stuff. Uh-huh. Do you know what to do that, too? Yeah. And would that be considered tapotment as well? Yes, you can do a very gentle one. Yeah, some people might call that uh, tapping and uh, yeah. Some of the names we use are sort of made up and some of them are common ones that you might see on the exam. So like these categories you'd see on the exam. And when I call out the specific types of cupping uh, percussion, those are uh, exam names. But when we start naming things based on the shape of the pattern we're making or whatever, that's just made up. Yeah. But you can call it the horse trot if you like. Uh, Keisha. Uh, the and then is a light tapping, right? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, you start off lighter and you can practice on your leg right now. The most common area is the upper back or back. It's okay to do this on the, on the, um, on the legs too, but the most common is, is, the, is the back. Uh, you start off lighter, but then you can get you can get into the muscle when it's warmed up. We just don't want to do that on the kidneys, and we don't want to do that on bony landmarks. But if you're on the muscles, you can get in there. The thing is, you want your hands, your wrists to be springy. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of emphasizing sort of like the upbeat, and you're nice and springy. Except for like on the foot, right? When we were doing this mm -hmm. and people like that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what this is most typically used for, like we did with the foot massage, is to sort of help invigorate and liven and wake people up. So people will get extremely deeply relaxed. And as you've already started to see, fully asleep on your tables. And they might have to drive after, they might have to have a work meeting right after. Uh, so sometimes you kind of want to like help wake them up. This technique is not as common as the others and some massage therapists don't use it at all, right? Like it's uh, just because you're doing a Swedish massage, you don't have to do this. Not everyone uses this, right? You could kind of start gently and ask the person if they like it. Questions, comments, yeah? Um, so with the horse trot, is that like a facial like a little light tapping? Um, sometimes people do light tapping along the spine. Um, Actually on it? Yeah, it's very light. Uh, I haven't really seen tapping on the face so yeah, much. Again, you can kind of put so people out. Easy. You can put people out very gently. Yeah, sure. Uh, range of motion, Swedish gymnastics, joint movements. Um, this is traditionally part of Swedish massage, but is one of those that a lot of massage therapists don't do as much of. Um, so if you're doing a fully relaxing massage, clients don't always expect that you're also stretching them, right? But it can be a, a very excellent therapeutic and relaxing thing to do. So it's a great thing to do. It's just not all Swedish massages include it. There's different types of stretches, active, passive, active, assisted, and so forth. And we'll, you know, get into those sort of as we learn some and practice some. Yeah. 
I would, yeah, I would, I would uh, ask them if they want that. And I would, uh, you know, you're coming up with like a treatment plan and what are their goals? And then you can kind of suggest like, oh, the, you know, would you like some of this? And yeah, I would, I would ask about the stretching. Yep. Yeah, and I think the main reason, and then Elizabeth might want to jump in on this, but I mean, I think the main reason that it's not used as much as it really could be is I think sometimes the, the massage therapist thinks it's going to disturb their relaxed client to move them in any way. But I think you'd be surprised, even if your client is relaxing, they don't usually mind you moving them for a good stretch. Similar. Sometimes yeah. I'll even request it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then so those are all the official techniques of Swedish massage. But Swedish massage often also includes static holds, compression, and foot massage techniques. So we'll start tomorrow's techniques with the static hold, where you're just kind of like we ended with the foot holds. Uh, it could be standard to kind of hold in the middle of the back or close to the back of the neck and uh, the low back or sacrum, uh, heavy pressure and still, that can be common uh, way to start or end the back. And you could do some other holds too, like on the knees or so forth. Compression, we did a lot of that very, very standard. It's very common for a massage therapist to start with some compression warm up, even like not undraping the client first. But I would just say that most clients are expecting skin on skin. So you just don't want to do that for too long, or they'll be wondering when the heck are you going to get started. Uh, but it's very common to start with some compressions to warm things up. And there is completely a fully a technique missing up ahead. So I'm gonna have to back up for a second or I just missed it somehow. I, I fully don't see it. So I'll be backing up there and just, just for a second. Um, and then, of course, foot massage techniques, very often included in a relaxing massage. Uh, the one that is some here, somehow not here, uh, that is part of a Swedish massage is uh, the, the rocking. Um, there's uh, in the, the technique of Swedish massage, the category is called vibration. And there's two types of vibration, fine and coarse. Coarse is much more common, and what a coarse vibration is, is rocking. So rocking is super common to use in a Swedish massage, and I will show you various ways to do that. The fine vibration is, is another one that a lot of massage therapists don't use, and I think honestly just because it's so hard to do, um, but some massage therapists use tools to use a fine vibration. So a fine vibration is you're tensing all of the muscles in your forearm to make your hands shake. God, is it awkward. Although I've had a really amazing fine vibration of my spine yeah. done before, and that was awesome. Yeah. It feels nice, but it's hard to do. And so some people will use tools for it. When we get to trigger point, uh, people have different approaches to trigger point. And some people uh, kind of add their own little, like, fine vibration to that, you know, so it can be used on nerve centers, you know, if you get good at it, you can use it. But a lot of massage therapists don't use that one. And also a lot of massage therapists can't do the fine vibration with both hands. I'm not very good at it with my left hand. That's fine on the left side. <laughs> All right, so that's the basic categories of Swedish. Um, let's talk about a couple the terminology here. Um, let's see. We don't have to talk about some of this is review. We don't have to talk about all of it, but I, I do want to call a few things out. Uh, end feel. You'll definitely see this on your licensing exam. So whenever you do range of motion or stretching, where the um, end of the movement goes is going to be the end feel. And when we study assessment and treatment, we'll talk about different end feels. 
but there can be like a hard end feel or a soft end feel. And they kind of give you different information about what might be going on with that joint. Um, but da -da, I'm just going to look at the ones that are, we didn't talk about yet. Joint play is the amount of movement a joint is capable of. Range of motion. This is amount of movement that's possible. Um, and every joint has an amount uh, that a range that it should be able to move in. And your client may have less than optimal range, right, for a certain movement. A routine refers to a series of strokes applied in a certain order. Um, so that that's always applied in the same way. So some people will always do the same techniques in the same order and have a routine. Um, if you have a routine that you always do, one advantage is when you're doing your chart notes, you can call that routine something, have a key for it, and just write it down. Uh, but in most cases, most people modify treatments um, for what people need. Sequencing refers to the order of the strokes. Uh, and the order that the massage is performed in. And there will be a couple task questions on this. Uh, for Swedish massage, one of the most common things is that they'll, um, you'll want to, um, like especially lymphatic drainage, you'll want to clear the proximal part of a limb before you clear the distal part of the limb. So you basically want to clear the fluid towards the lymph nodes proximally and then distally, but in a distal to proximal direction, right? We want the blood to go the, and the lymph to go this way, but we're clearing proximal before we're clearing distal. So that's an example of a sequence. Um, another example of a sequence is like on the legs or the arms, we'll often say hello to the entire limb first, and then we might work with the distal, a proximal limb, and then the distal limb, and then the entire limb. We can also talk about the very specific sequence of each technique we do. Questions? Synovial joint is a type of uh, joint that's freely movable. The other name for it is a diarthrotic joint. And these are the joints that we've been working with so far. So your um, your elbow, your glenohumeral joint, these are all synovial joints. When we get to the skeletal system in anatomy, you'll look at all the other categories. So this is just an introduction based on Swedish. Questions, comments? All right, I think we're almost there we're going to talk about some other yeah let's let's talk about just a few other principles and ideas here okay this comes up all the time as a question and i i'm gonna i would bet money that even if i cover it now people will still ask me later will you take take that bet um <laughs> i don't i don't think i'm gonna take that bet all right <laughs> So you will see in textbooks or videos or whatever, people will say, always apply the strokes towards the heart. And then anytime a student will see a teacher do something other than that, they'll ask, aren't we supposed to apply to the heart? So let me explain this thinking and when it's true and when it's not true. Was it my phone? Yes. That's super fun. I hope it's a good case. It's been through a lot. <laughs> Um, so the idea about applying strokes to the heart, right, is that we want to help the circulation towards the heart, but this is really uh, only applicable for strokes that are circulatory in nature. So if you're applying lymphatic drainage, that is definitely true. If you're applying a long flowy stroke towards the heart for the purpose of trying to get that, help that blood flow, yes, sure, true. But there are hundreds of times, thousands even, where you're not going in that direction. There's all kind of strokes where, you know, we get all jacked up. All our limbs get, you know, because of our origins and insertions, we get jacked up like this. And so there's all kind of times we want to help 
pull the people back out, right? So lots of times we're doing lots of things away from the heart, just not our very intentionally circulatory techniques. Our venous system, our arterial system is designed so that you really can't make the blood go in the wrong direction. So we can help the blood go in a good direction, but we can't make it not go in the right direction. If you're going to see a test question about the logic around it or the concern around it, the concern around doing deep work in the uh, wrong direction would be a concern or fear for hurting the one way valves in the veins. But you're not going to hurt those. Uh, and we're doing non circulatory techniques against the flow. Um, if somebody has big varicosities, big varicose veins, they do have damaged veins already. So then we want to be more careful with them, right? They do have damaged veins and you don't want to damage them further, but everybody else, you know, you're going to be just fine. Yep. Questions, comments? I'm glad I didn't take that back. I've been making some good money. Yeah. We guess you're going to have to pay us. Oh. <laughs> 10 bucks every time, we guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, you know, just a few more things about effleurage. We talked about how you're spreading the product. Sometimes you'll see the word lubricant. You might even see it on a test question. I would not use that word with clients because it usually means a sexual lubricant. But if you were to see it like on a test question, it's talking about lotion, oil, etc. But don't talk to a client about lubricant. Don't ask them what kind of lubricant they want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Let's talk about some of the effects because this most definitely is a lic licensing exam questions are most definitely based on effects and benefits. And we'll have a whole little chapter where we talk uh, about every system of the body that's actually due next week. So this is just a little preview. I would say the most confusing part of this part of the test question is that there's some overlap, right? These different strokes do different things. And a lot of times they do very similar things. I would say that's the hardest part of this type of te test question. You also might see like an MBLIX test question that says some of the effects, right? But it's not going to match this list exactly. So you kind of kind of choose the best combo. Effleurage can rub off dead skin cells. Another word for that is exfoliate, E X F F O L I A T E. Um, and you'll see that. You'll feel it even in the summer. That's probably my least favorite thing is getting uh, a combination of skin and product. And you get these like little like balls of like it's it's colored whatever color their skin is and so you'll see it like on your arms and hands and, and uh and hair you go down you get a big skin ball of skin and hair yeah that's fun what do you do with where do you dispose of that <laughs> <laughs> a biohazard bag oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see me walking out of massage like this? It's like I'm covered. In you just put it on top of the head or something. I I would put it on uh Kleenexes or sheets, right? I mean, if you put it on your sheets, you're gonna have to clean it out. So you could put on like a Kleenex or something. Elizabeth and I don't mean to gross you out. It's not going to be every single client. Uh, most of the time, you're not going to end up all covered in fur and. <laughs> skin <laughs> it will happen it, will. it happens more in the summer right mm. people get they get their sunburns and you don't want to touch them when they're fully burned but as it's healing right they're shedding more yeah. like, like snakes <laughs> we could say a lot more gross things if we wanted to gross you out <laughs> Holding back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 one time. Uh, 
All right, so the effleurage is good mm -hmm. at increasing or encouraging local circulation and lymph flow. You know, when we study the lymphatic system, you'll see that actually any kind of deep pressure actually inhibits all the lymph flow. So this is only when you're going really light. It can aid in tissue recovery, reduce muscle soreness, and, you know, the contraindications is any kind of the open skin stuff. Uh, and skin lesion, a lesion is just any kind of change or problem in the skin. Um, it can, I'm, I'm going to look at this local circulation thing. You know, you'll definitely see that on licensing exam questions, both for effleurage and petrissage. But I've seen, you know, uh, some uh, massage uh, teachers talk about the research that, you know, there really isn't a lot of research that it has like a significant circulatory effect, but that's, that's still what folks say. That would still be a test question. And, you know, we're going to be assessing, right, the whole time. As soon as we're looking at the client and as, as soon as they walk in the door and as soon as we're doing effleurage and petrissage, right, we're assessing. Um, we never use force. We start lighter. We get deeper. And each of these is separate. So... Petrissage has similar in the sense of kind of that uh, it actually is circulatory locally. Uh, it can also warm up or make the tissue, the muscle softer or more pliable, so more stretchy. And it can start to break up adhered or in other words, stuck together fibers. Yes, you're good. Okay. Hope everything's all right. Okay. Hope everything's okay. Uh, it can simulate uh, sebaceous uh, secretions, local circulation. So that's all about increasing the nutrient and waste exchange. It can decrease muscle tension and decrease adhesions. They can talk about this too, kind of like flushing out the tissue. Yeah. All right. And we'll talk about more specific types later. So I think that's enough on that one. I just wanted to introduce you to their effects. And we'll talk about effects more next week. Take this in little bite-sized pieces. All right, I think friction is a confusing one on the test because there's two different main types of friction. And the one where you're going like this has a very, that's called warming friction. I'm spinning around. That one, <laughs> that one has a very different effect than the one that you go slow and do. I'm amusing, Elizabeth. I did. Let's see if I do it again. My little friction dance. Uh, so this warming friction is heat producing, you know, it's warming, uh, it can heat, heat up, heat up the tissue and, uh, break up the tissue, but our, all of our other types of friction, you know, they're really starting to work with the connective tissue. They can break up scars, adhesions, which is another word for knots, trigger points, etc. Now, this cross fiber friction, uh, it's given credit to Cyriax. That's the guy's last name, C Y R I X. On a test question, you're going to see this Cyriac cross fiber friction, especially good for scar tissue. He was a sports medicine guy, and he would go across the fibers, and that's really good for scar tissue. I did that for. He got credit for some reason. That's mine. Now, the thing about this cross fiber friction, just to introduce you to it, is it can be very effective for scar tissue, 
but it also um, creates some inflammation, right? So the body creates a response against it. And so this is not a good technique to do, right? If the person already has inflammation. Yep. Yep. I have a really a pretty gnarly scar on my foot. Yep. From a surgery. Okay. I was doing some cross steps on it. Okay. That area obviously Yeah, yeah. And that's across Syria, cross fiber friction is not the only way to work with scar tissues. Uh, we'll look at myofascial release. Actually, we'll do a lot of myofascial release, and that's also very good for scar tissues. You can also use linear friction. Yeah. So massaging your own body yep. is very different. Why? Just, just, um, yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, I feel like there's a lot to it, honestly. And I feel like class is going to end in five minutes, and people have been here a long time and are a little restless. So why don't we talk about that when I'm not like last five minutes yeah okay. i'm feeling the like people are done energy mm -hmm. yeah I'm getting that stop talking vibe <laughs> i'm getting it i'm getting it pretty hard <laughs> what's that i do i do all right so vibration um First, when you first apply it, it can be stimulating. And then as you do it longer, it can be relaxing. So there's some techniques where they talk about that, right? Like what happens at first? And then if you do it longer, what happens? They talk about that with the use of hot and cold and contrast. They talk about that with vibration and they talk about that with topotment. So topotment, they say the same thing that when you first apply it, it's stimulating. So like if you had like a week, a sleep underused muscle, you could use topotment or vibration to help try to wake it up. And then if you did those things longer, it would calm it down. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. Like I said, next week, we're gonna have a whole module uh, getting more into the therapeutic effects and we're gonna get deeper into it, right? And the effects on the different systems. Um, yes. Uh, I have a question about the friction, the, like, uh, and transverse, the difference between those. Yeah, so Syriac's cross fiber and transverse are both the same. You're going against the fiber, yeah. but there's linear, which is going with the fiber. Yeah, so transverse is the same. Same as, yeah. Yeah, and so people will... Um, People will use the term for Syriac cross fiber interchangeably or the same as just cross fiber or transverse. Yeah, yeah. But you'll see Syriac's name on test questions and it's all about scar tissue. Yeah. So any other questions before we wrap it up for the day? And 